66 NSS report, National Sample Survey report on employment and unemployment during 2005-2010. This period was, this recent period was covered by NSS 66th survey. It points out the growth rate of employment of all kinds during 2000-2005 was at the rate of 2.7%. During 2005-2010, it has come down to 0.82%, less than 1% in the last 5 years. And it also further points out, India's workforce consists of self-employed 51%, regular wage employment 16%, 16%, casual employment 33%. They call it as Casualization of Indian labor. 51%, more than half of the India's workforce is self-employed. The rest of the 49%, regular wage employment is only 16%. See, employment, they talk of two kinds of employment. The quality of employment and the quantity of employment. Quantity of employment is inadequate. So, as the quality of employment is concerned, good quality employment means Regular salary earning employment. The laborer knows when he gets the next salary, he has got paid holiday, he has got all social security facilities. This kind of employment is termed as good quality employment. Then there is bad quality employment. Bad quality employment is, is casual employment. If the two workers are working in the same factory, one regular worker, another casual worker, if a regular worker gets 15,000 rupees, casual workers get only 5,000 rupees. One third of what the regular salary uh, worker gets. And the casual worker does not have enjoy any paid holiday, no social security. When the work is there, he is called, when, the, when there is no work, he is deployed. So, highly unsecure job is this casual employment. And this casual employment, according to NSC 66 survey, is 33% of the employment is casual employment. Regular good quality employment is only 1-16% of the employment. In Bangalore these days, I don't know the situation in Chennai and other places, in Bangalore, in the corporate sector, the regular talk is what is called temping. Temping is temporary employment. It's a respectable name for the heinous activity. Container is very good, content is rotten. It is called temping. Temping means no permanent employment, only temporary employment. The corporate sector. Even in the software industry, temping is rampant in Bangalore. So, and the Grizzle research study report published recently points out India needs at least 55 million additional jobs by 2015, another 2-3 years. India needs at least 55 additional, 55 million additional jobs by 2015 to maintain current ratio of employed people to the total population at 39%. Even to maintain the, this ratio of low ratio of 39%, we need to create 55 million new jobs by in the next two or three years. And this many jobs are definitely not being created in the Central government labor ministry points out. 11 million people will join labor force every year from 2011-12. 11 million addition. In addition to the backlog of unemployed, 11 million new people are entering the labor market and creation of jobs is horrible in this country. So, so much so for the first parameter that Manmohan Singh has given. Employment generation is the first parameter of evaluating economic growth. Now coming to poverty reduction. Poverty is the greatest curse on this country. Several political parties have encashed this poverty. Very be hatao. This, this slogan we have heard umpteen times. Very be hatao. Inclusive growth. These are all very attractive slogans that the political parties want to encash. So far as poverty reduction is concerned, there is total confusion in the government sector and the planning commission as to what is poverty and who is poor and how many poor people are there in this country. For example, the planning commission last year, it filed an affidavit with, uh, with uh, the Supreme Court stating that 
cut off uh, income for uh, below poverty line. Rural people, 26 rupees a day. If they have 26 income of 26 rupees a day, government will consider them as poor. If they have less than 26 rupees per day in these days of high inflation, mind it, 26 rupees per day and less, only such people are considered as poor. In urban area, 32 rupees per day if you have an income, you are rich. If you have less than 32 rupees per day, you are considered below poverty line. Two months ago, Mante Singh Aplavalia had the guts to announce to the nation that the poverty has been curtailed in the last two years to a very great extent. Inflation has come down and therefore this poverty line is further reduced. That the rural poverty cut off income is reduced from 26 rupees to 22 rupees. So according to the present estimate, if you have 22 rupees, you can lead a very happy life in this country in the rural area. And for urban area, it has been reduced from 32 rupees to 28 rupees. Planning Commission spends 35 lakh rupees for repairing its toilets in the Yojana Bhavan. When it comes to defining the poor people, it says rural people that can lead a good life with 22 rupees per day and urban people with 28 rupees per day. And for this, you know, all over the country, Pantex Singh of Lovania has been severely castigated. Now, how many poor people are there? You see, how many estimates are there? Planning Commission says 28% of the population in India are below poverty line. Suresh Tendulkar was a member of the Planning Commission. He estimated it is 37% of the population below poverty line. Jensen Saxena was a secretary of the Road Development Ministry in the Union Government and this chairmanship a committee was appointed to estimate poverty and he pointed out 50% of the people in India are below poverty line. Arjun Sen Gupta, when the UPA first government appointed National Commission on Enterprises in the Unorganized Sector under the Chairmanship of Dr. Arjun Sen Gupta, he points out 78% of the people of this country as on 2007, 78% of the people of this country are forced to live on a daily consumption expenditure of less than 20, 20 rupees. So according to him, 78% of the population of this country are below poverty line. Human Development Report 2010, it gave a new definition of poverty line which is called Multidimensional Poverty Index. So the HDR 2010 estimated 55% of the population of the country are below poverty line. United Nations follows a method, those people who have a daily consumption expenditure of 2 American dollars and less, they are considered as poor. So according to this UN definition of 2 dollars a day, 80% of India's population are below poverty line. Now see, how many estimates? Planning Commission 28%, Suresh Tendu 37%, NC Saxena 50%, Arjun Sen Gupta 78%, HDR 2000 55%, UN 2 dollars a day, 80%. How many poor people are there in this country? Government does not know. Planning Commission does not know. Nobody knows. So this is the situation. When you are not creating employment, you are not reducing poverty. And you do not know what is poor, who is poor, how many poor people are there. When this is the state of confusion, government has totally failed in the eradication of poverty. Then, with regard to poverty eradication, the income distribution, uh, this Maxine uh, Mutter seen business line, uh, uh, annual survey of India super rich. They consider a person as super rich only on the basis of his investment in shares and other securities of different companies. Those who have an investment of 100 crores and more in different companies are considered as super rich. So, according to this list, 2012 Business World uh, Survey list, there are 497 super rich families or super rich persons in India as of 2012. 497, not 497 lakh or crore, 
497 super rich families whose total wealth as on 2012 is 13,50,000 crores. 13,50,000 crore rupees is the total wealth of these 497 persons. And these 497 persons have there in their pocket 26% of India's GDP. Out of this, this the business world report tells out 46 people who are called Indian billionaires. That is, those people who have investment of more than rupees 1000 crore, either in their company or in different companies. The total wealth of these 46 Indians is 10 lakh crore rupees. That is, 74% of the wealth of these 497 persons is marketed by just 46 people. These are the super rich. On the one hand, you have got 497 persons who have 13,050 lakh crore rupees. On the other hand, you have 78% of the people, according to Arjun Sen Gupta property, who are forced to live on a daily consumption expenditure of less than 20 rupees. Less than 20 rupees is even according to the latest estimate of planning commission is below poverty line. This was in 2007. Our poverty is crystallized in our villages. And poverty is crystallized in our agriculture. The state of agriculture yesterday, Dr. Namadwar very, very, very uh, lucidly pointed out. The moment we mention Indian agriculture, especially in the post-globalized era, one data is absolutely essential. National Crime Records Bureau, which is giving annual uh, uh, score of farmers' suicide. From 1995 to 2011, in the 16 years of globalization out of 20, 270,000 farmers all over the country have committed suicide. This is also an underestimation because according to National Crime Records Bureau, only those people who have Pahani and Patta, that is land records in their name, if they commit suicide, this name will be entered in the register. If the farmer's wife commits suicide, his father commits suicide, or a landless agricultural farmer commits suicide, or a tenant farmer commits suicide, they will not be entered in this register. Only those farmers who have got land records in their name, their far, uh, suicide itself is 260,000 farmers have committed suicide in the 16 years of globalization. In the last 15,000 years of Indian agricultural history, this kind of a tragedy has never taken place. Even during the British period when farmers were not very really happy, so many farmers have not committed suicide. Of this 260,000 farmers, the big five states, which is described as the farmer suicide belt, they account for 61% of the total farmer suicide. Maharashtra, 53,000 uh, 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 suicides. Andhra, 33,000. Karnataka, 37,000 farmer suicide. Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, 42,000 farmer suicide. Totally, these five states account for 1,66,000. 6,685 farmer suicide, which accounts to 61.52% of the total farmer suicide. And you must know, this special economic zone where farmer's lands are forcibly occupied, most of the special economic zones are located in these five states, which is described as farmer's suicide belt. Well, so much with regard to the poverty eradication and eradication of the poor people. Well, now we will come to the improvement of the standard of living. The United Nations and the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, that the organization, they consider that defined economic development, not in terms of dollars, not in terms of so many rupees. They consider development of a country or economic development in terms of the basic facilities provided by the society or the government to the common people. What is the longevity of the people? If a child is born today, for how many years it is expected to lead a healthy life? That is health. Then, schooling. How many children in the school going age are really in the school and how many of them are outside the school? Then, the general standard of living. 
economic standard, how many of them have got a, even arithmetic about it? How many of them have drinking water? How many of them have proper nutrition? So, taking only these basic facilities afforded by the government to the people, they give scores to these countries and rank them according to this score. This is called human development ranking. Okay. In 2005, after, four, after 14 years of globalization, in 2005, out of 177 countries for which the ranking was given, India's human development ranking was 127. He was bottom 50. India was in the heap of the bottom 50. 2006, out of 177 countries, our ranking was 126. 2007, out of 177 countries, our ranking was 128. We further went down. 2008, out of 182 countries, our ranking was 132. Again, what? Heap of bottom 50. 2009, out of 182 countries, our ranking was 134. Two steps further down. 2010, out of 169 countries, India's human development ranking was 119. 2011, out of 187 countries, India's ranking was 134. We refused to rise above the heap of bottom 50 countries. What is the ranking of other countries which can never be compared with India so far as GDP is concerned? Sri Lanka. It is an insult to compare ourselves with Sri Lanka. What is the size of Sri Lanka? What is the resources of Sri Lanka? What is the size of India and what is the size of resources? India is a trillion dollar economy. India claims to be a superpower in the community of the world's nations. Sri Lanka's human development ranking according to 2011 HDR report was 97. Great India, 134. Thailand, 103. Indonesia, 124. Vietnam, the country which is partly America and you know, it is not a trillion dollar economy. Its ranking is 128 and its trillion dollar economy is human development ranking is 134. Six steps below even a, a, a small country like Vietnam. The report very clearly points out, points out that to improve the human development ranking, a country need not be a rich country. It is not your GDP, it is not your richness that measures the human development, uh, 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 human development of the people. It is the ability of the, of the government. It is the willingness of the government to take whatever money you have for the benefit of the poor people. Here is a country which claims to be a trillion dollar country which refuses to claim above the, you know, heap of the bottom 50 countries. Kenya, Katanga, Uganda, Burundi, Burundi. These are the countries which India keeps so far as human development ranking is concerned. In 2008, the International Food Policy Research Institute it published a report that is International Global Hunger Index. 88 countries were measured on a scale of whether the country is able to provide adequate food and nutrition to its people. Out of 88 countries, India's ranking was 66. So, India is one of the hungriest countries in the world according to the International Food Policy Research Let us throw away all parameters. Let us have only one parameter of the success of economic policy. See, even dogs, cats and rats take, take care of their children. Even birds take care of their offspring. They make collective woodworms and feed their children. So, whether economic policy of a country is successful or not can be judged by only one parameter, how the country is looking after its children. Its own children, not somebody else's children. See, 11th January 2012, this year, January 2012, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh released a report in Delhi. The report was called Hangama Report. Hangama Report is hunger and malnutrition. The report describing the hunger and malnutrition of children below 5 years. This is called a Hangama Report. The report pointed out 
42% of the children in the trillion dollar economy called India under 5 years are malnourished. 42% of the children below 5 years are malnourished. And in one of the weakest moments, Manmohan Singh called it as a national shame. He forgot there are several other national shames. He picked out this. In one of the weakest moments, he said, it is a national shame. The country is not able to look after its children in spite of it being a trillion dollar economy. Then, very recently, the UNICEF, which released the report on 19th July 2021, this July, the UNICEF, it measured the status of children in 141 countries over a period of 15 years. What are the parameters it took? Infant mortality, that is the health of the children. If the children are not healthy, they will die within one year. That's called IMR, infant mortality rate, per thousand children. How many children die within one year of their birth? This is infant mortality. Then underweight, that is malnutrition. If a ch child is suffering from malnutrition, it will not gain weight according to the age. So that is called underweight. Then out of school, how many children are not attending school? Only these three basic parameters were selected by the UNICEF. And 141, 41 countries were measured over a period of 15 years which covers major portion of the 20 years of globalization period. And the report released in July, it points out, out of 141 countries measured for their looking of their children, 127 countries improved the status of their children over this 15 year period. Only 14, 14 unfortunate countries experienced continuous decline in the status of their children over this 15 year period. Out of these most of unfortunate 14 countries, this trillion dollar economy in India is also. Over 15 year period, the status of our children has gone down, down and down. Which are the other countries which are taking company with India in this, you know, infamous list of 14 countries? Trinidad and Tobago, Madagascar, Guatemala. 90% of the people cannot identify these countries in a map, given a map. And this great country is keeping company with the Trinidad, Tobago, Guatemala. Over a 15 year period, the status of children with basic parameters such as infant mortality, underweight and out of school, the status of children has gone down and down. Whatever may be your GDP, whatever may be your FDI, you know, Maro Holy to all these things. If you are not able to look after your own children in a proper way, what's the use of this globalization? What's the use of this activity? What's the use of your uh, GDP growth? What is, the, what is the status of a member of the G20? Of what use? You are not able to look after your own children. See this, firstly, so far as the human development uh, is concerned, the uh, standard of living, Manmohan Singh said, growth is not an ending itself, it must also improve the standard of living of our people. What is the standard of living of our people? Census 2011, I briefly mentioned it yesterday. Census 2011, along with counting the heads, also conducted a family survey, status of family survey. The report was published very recently, a few months back. It points out, 60% of the people in India, they use mobiles. 53% of the houses do not have toilet. India is the largest openly defecating country in the whole world, writes the census commissioner in this report. 53% of the people, houses, they do not have toilet. Charpen, individual countries, Charpen, 77%, Odisha, 76%, Bihar, 76% of the houses do not have a toilet. They are openly defecate. 41% of the houses do not have bathing facility. 49% of the houses do not have drainage. 67% of the households, 67% of the households, they use firewood, crop residue, powder cake, coal and charcoal as the prominent cooking fuel. You know, in a, in a small house where there is no ventilation, if you start cooking with powder cake and uh, the, the fuel and all that, 
the amount of smoke that is generated, carbon monoxide and other gases that is generated, it is equal to the woman smoking 10 packs of cigarettes per day. It causes as much damage to her lungs and health as a person smoking 10 cigarettes a day. And even after 20 years of globalization, our, and our government has facilitated all our women to smoke 20 packs of cigarette a day without giving a pipe for buying cigarettes. This is kind of fuel. Government is giving so many you know, lakhs of crores of rupees for kerosene subsidy. The report points out only 3% of the households they use kerosene as a fuel. Using kerosene is a great improvement. In a situation where 63 percent of 67 percent of the houses are using fire, firewood, crop residue, powder, coal, and charcoal, this is so far as the improvement in the standard of living is concerned. And lastly, environmental sustainability. And once you also that the growth also should be environmentally sustainable. How sustainable our environment is? India today is the fourth largest carbon dioxide emitting country in the world after China, USA, Japan and Japan India is the fourth largest, largest polluting country in the world carbon dioxide emitting country fourth largest consumer of petroleum products fourth largest consumer of petroleum products since 1981 when the Forest Conservation Act was passed the experts point out for a healthy environment, one third of the land area of a country should be under forest cover. In the year 1981, the Forest Conservation Act was passed. After the passing of the Forest Conservation Act in 1981, 12 lakh hectare of forest have been diverted from forest purposes to non-forest purposes, especially mining purposes and the construction of the thermal electric plants and other things. 25% of this diversion has taken place in the last 5 years, 2006 to 2011, that is the 11 5 year plan period. Then, what about the pollution of Ganga? How many crore rupees have flown down the drain of cleaning Ganga? What's the state of Ganga? What's the state of Yamuna? What's the state of our national river? What's the state of Kaveri? What's the state of... You take any river for that matter. They have become national gutters. This is how we have been maintaining our agenda. So this way, you, do, you take any parameter for that cause. I use this parameter because these parameters have been, have been given by Dr. Manmohan Singh Tinsal, who is the high priest of globalization. <coughs> you see government reports, you see United Nations reports, other international agency reports, all the reports they give the same result that this globalization policy of 20 years has been a miserable failure. Except for 497 persons who have got 13 lakh 50 thousand power rupees in their pocket, 26 percent of India's GDP. It is these people who see the aims of globalization. How India has grown out of, you know, through globalization. How India has made a big name. How Americans are coming to India for uh, uh, getting medical facility. India is a preferred destination of medical tourism, they say. What about the health of these people? Sixty-seven percent of the people, women, they cook with no? wet fuel and other things. Fifty-three percent of the people do not have toilet at all. And your hospitals are inviting Americans to provide cheap medical tourism, health facilities. <coughs> Who is the first element of the resources of this country? Are the Americans or our own people in the backyard? And now we have got a very serious crisis. Foreign capital is not coming and therefore Anmohan Singh is trying to say, I want, he has taken charge and he has given now, now they have given charge to uh, teach number of and together they are singing the song that they want to open the floodgates of uh, uh, foreign capital to India once again and therefore they want to bring two, two changes on a priority basis. Increase FDI cap in the insurance sector from 26% to 49% and open FDI for retail trade. There are national priorities. 
When the military goes to talk or not, they are not for that. They want fighting card. They want to please the IMF, maybe or they can fight. So the, the the chances of government opening the country for FDI in multi-brand retail is very imminent. Almost every day they are talking of these things. And we must be very, very careful. It's a question of life and death of four crore families in this country who are engaged in retail trade at different levels. It's a great fortune of Pradesh Jagaranpan, which are work at in Trichy uh, uh, and the organizers. They have brought a, a very resourceful, a very great person, Mr. Shekhar Swami, is, is with us to talk about the implications of uh, uh, opening uh, multi brand retail to FDI. So, with these things, a few remarks, I want to uh, stop my lecture. And finally, I point out that globalization will never be a panacea to the Indian problems of Indian economy. Indian economy needs Indian solution. Solutions prepared by India, an economic policy which answers the immediate problems of India, which suits the cultural setup of this country and the economic setup of this country. It should not be made in America or made in England or made in IMF and IBRD. It must be made in India, by India and for India. So it's only this Swadeshi economic policy that can give a permanent solution to the economic problems of this country and not any amount of globalization.